Thanks, Andrew. It's good to, good to see you all here this morning. Your bulletin says that Deirdre is preaching today, but uh, sometimes we forget to tell Amy that we've made some changes, so obviously I'm not her. Um, the title for the sermon today is uh, Confronting the Idol of Security. Our typical image of idolatry is one where we think that people are worshiping gods in the form of statues that are made of stone or wood or metal. And, uh, you know, the people that worshiped those kinds of idols, those kinds of gods, believed that the god that they were worshiping had powers over important aspects of their lives, like their, their farming or their families or their ability to have children and the weather. And so they made sacrifices to them, and when things got really bad, when their circumstances got challenging, when they were experiencing suffering, uh, they would believe that the gods were mad at them, and so they would have to make more and more extreme sacrifices. Uh, and as, as we will see as we get through um, the, uh, the, the Pentateuch and other, and other texts, that uh, some of the nations that surrounded Israel would even engage in a child sacrifice uh, to, to manipulate, manipulate and please their gods in order to bring about uh, an end to the suffering. And, um, you know, we, we consider ourselves above these kinds of perceptions in our enlightened state. But as we're going to see today, and as the, the texts of scriptures affirm throughout the Old and New Testament, um, we also as human beings outside of these ancient times have the tendency to become enslaved to idols and to worship idols as well. Because the heart of idolatry, the heart of idolatry is, is the belief that anything other than God brings about prosperity and happiness. In fact, you know, Paul will call greed idolatry in the New Testament. And so in this, this belief, whatever it is that we may, what, what it may be, it, it's, you know, if, it's, if it's greed or the, the lust and desire for, for money beyond what we need, uh, there's a belief. There's a belief that is generating that idolatry. And, and faith always leads to hope. And hope is that, that energizing power that we need to press on. Uh, and that presses us on to, to love, which essentially is making sacrifices. The, the, the very definition of love is that you're willing to make a sacrifice for, for something that you desperately uh, want or believe that is needed. And so faith and hope and love um, always follow. And we can love the wrong things. We can believe the wrong things. We can hope in the wrong things. And we can love the wrong things. And that's what idolatry is. That's the heart of idolatry. So we may not believe in gods that are made of, gods that are statues made of stone or wood or metal, but we do believe in other things that we believe are the source of our happiness and our prosperity, whether it's money or sex or security or power or pleasure or comfort. And we believe that these things will produce what we need for happiness and prosperity. So we put our hopes in them and then we love them. Faith, hope, and love, that's always a, a string of realities. And we need to hold firm, as the scriptures say, to faith, hope, and love. But faith in Christ, hope in Christ's power, and love towards God and towards others, others are the, the right faith and hope and love. But we can fa have faith and hope and love and other things. And so we're going to see that if we do place our faith and hope and love in other things other than God, eventually those things will bring about disaster. Those things will bring about death. The consequences of sin are, are death, the scriptures tell us. So we're going to look at a couple of examples of this this week and next week. We, we began to get into it last week with the story of of the uh, victory of Israel over Egypt by God's deliverance. And we saw the grumbling that Israel exhibited, and we, and we read it this morning. Um, so we're going to look at the idol of security. We're going to look at the idol of power today. And next week, we're going to look at uh, just food and drink. We're two very common idols 
that we'll see here in the story, but that we are certainly um, not exempt from. They're not so ancient. So we're going to look at two characters today. The first character we're going to look at is, is Pharaoh. And the second character we're going to look at is the entire nation of Israel as an entity. It's not obviously a single individual. It's millions of people. Um, but they are really reflected as two entities or two characters in the story. So let's look at Pharaoh. And we're going to, if we go back to chapter 1, we can remember that, <clears throat> that uh, Pharaoh did not know Joseph. You know, hundreds of years have, had gone by, and a pharaoh or king of Egypt came to power, and he, and he didn't know Joseph. He didn't know the history. So we know the story. Joseph was instrumental in establishing the, the bureaucracy of Egypt. Joseph was instrumental in bringing Egypt to a place of global power. Joseph was... was um, critical and central to Pharaoh's consolidation of power and enslaving as indentured servants all of the citizens to Pharaoh. That was, that was Joseph's uh, work that he accomplished while he was alive. So, so Joseph contributed much to the, the power and the wealth of Egypt and to the power and wealth of Pharaoh and so the, to the position of Pharaoh. So this Pharaoh comes to power. It's been so long. Um, they weren't, they weren't, uh, he didn't keep up with his history. And so he forgot Joseph, didn't know Joseph, and he looked out upon the nation of Israel. Pharaoh did. And he just saw Israel getting larger and larger in terms of its population. So he began to be afraid. He got insecure. He saw the size of Israel and believed that it would get to the point where it would overwhelm Egypt. So it was an insecurity about Egypt's own size and Egypt's ability to restrain uh, Israel if it got to the point where they wanted to rebel against them. And so what we're going to see here in principle is that people whose idol is power or sense of security um, always will have a fear of losing it if, it's not, if, it, if their sense of power and security is not founded upon God himself. It's something that they see that they are responsible for, and so they do all they can to fight to keep it. This sense of power, this sense of security. And power is what Pharaoh needs for happiness and prosperity. And he's going to sacrifice everything. He's going to sacrifice everything to hold on to that sense of power and security. Power without God breeds insecurity. So in this insecurity, he began to speculate about the future. And it's interesting, we'll see this also in Israel. Um, the idol of power and security, it does things to what, how we perceive history and how we perceive the future. Here, Pharaoh doesn't know. So in his ignorance about history, he's forming insecurities and those insecurities then project into a future that's not based upon reality. There's no threat to Egypt. Israel is, is, is doing nothing to threaten Egypt. And so he doesn't know his history, and he's speculating about the future, and he's making false assumptions about this future. And then he creates a narrative based upon his ignorance of history, speculations about the future. He creates a narrative that he begins to believe, and that he then pulls the entire nation of Egypt into. This narrative is that Israel's going to grow, they're going to ally th themselves with our enemies, and then they are going to uh, revolt against us and break away, and we'll no longer have our workforce. And then he convinces the entire nation of this narrative. So that then leads to the entire nation oppressing, enslaving, and murdering Israel. And the text is interesting in that it says, and then the entire nation grew in their dread of Israel. 
So their fear actually grew as their oppression and murder grew because now not only do they have this false narrative, now they've given the nation of Israel a reason to revolt, to rebel. And their consciences are also at work, uh, it, Egypt's consciences, because now they know that they've committed wrong against this nation. And so that also then generates fear and anxiety. And so it then led to them oppressing and treating Israel even more harshly. And then Pharaoh hardens his heart, the text says. And then God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And, and you know, one of the, one of the issues, um, Deirdre had a sermon on this in terms of why does God harden Pharaoh's heart? Eventually, God doesn't want a false repentance. If, if, if repentance is just going to come out of a desire to escape the penalty instead of the desire to do what's right, God is not interested in that kind of a repentance. And so Pharaoh is hardened, Egypt is hardened, and eventually, as we now know from going through the story, it brought about their destruction. So their concern for their own security, their concern to hold on to power, ultimately led them to lose it. If Pharaoh would have done nothing, there was no indication that Israel would have rebelled. Now we know the story of what God is going to do, etc., etc., etc. But God did not cause Pharaoh to have those fears and insecurities. We also, so I, you know, I think that, that um, it, it's, it's, it's very timely, it's a very obviously unfortunate situation that, that Ukraine is in with Russia, but you see these dynamics really unfolding in, in a way so similar to what the story of Exodus has here. So, you know, if you've, if, you've, if you've been reading and reading about Putin and his history, you know, he, he believes that the downfall of the, the Soviet Union was one of the, the greatest catastrophes of the 20th century, um, which is saying a lot considering all of the great catastrophes of the 20th century. He was the head of the KGB, which was, you know, their security agency, the Soviet Union's and Russia's security agency. Um, he's been president for 22 years, I believe, and, uh, and he essentially uh, got rid of the term limits in, in Russia, and so he could be president if everything continues on as it is for another 14 years till 2036. And so it, people that know President Putin understand him to be a person who lusts and thirsts for power and is holding on to it and wants to see Russia in a place of being recognized as a powerful nation. And his self-aggrandizement, his self-promotion, you can see that, that, that all of these things are playing into his idolatry of power. And the arrogance and the corruption that is present in that. So um, in, this, in, this, in this quest for power, the, it, just, it just spreads throughout the political and, and military levels of, of authority. And so you have all these people pursuing power, pursuing wealth, and they believe that that's, 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 there's an arrogance that has led to this desire to overcome Ukraine and bringing it back into the, the motherland. But what's also happened over the years is that they, there are some people that believe that as much as 80% of the money that was supposed to go into the military actually went into the pockets of, of these various levels of rulers along the way and the generals. And so what's happening is that this pursuit and quest of power is actually leading to a great international embarrassment. And, and it's looking like they're not going to be able to take over Ukraine, and, it's, and it's, the, the economic sanctions are, are pressing down. They did not re realize the level of resistance that they would get from all circles. And who knows what the future is? We can't tell the future, but it, it seems like what is playing out before our eyes is what was playing out with Egypt and Israel and Pharaoh. 
You know, there's a, I was reading a, a Thomas Friedman, Tr- Friedman's article this week, uh, just kind of, kind of comparing uh, Russia and China and America and how we and how we approach, you know, just term limits and release of power. And so, uh, both Putin and President Xi of of China have essentially eliminated their term limits. Um, but America has held on to term limits and. There's this, there's this willingness to release power. And he brought up, if you've seen the, the musical Hamilton, you know, George Washington at the end of his second term um, wanted to step down. And then Alexander Hamilton thought he was crazy because it would seem weak. And then George Washington replied, he said, no, we, they will recognize that in this stepping down from power, it's actually strong. It's actually strong. And so that's Pharaoh. We see it in, in what's happening in our current times. So let's look at Israel. So last week's story, so Israel, their backs are against the water. They see Pharaoh and his armies, the entire army, approaching And the text says that they feared greatly. So they were in this place of insecurity, this place of insecurity. Their recent history was that God had saved them. God had performed these plagues and that God had saved them and God had promised that that he would bring them into this, this promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. But in their fear and insecurity and in forgetting their history, they began to speculate about their future just like Pharaoh did. We're all going to die here in the wilderness. And then they actually change history. They said, is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. They never said that. They never believed that. They never thought that. They, they were crying to God for help because their babies were getting murdered and they were being treated harshly, beaten daily. And so this, this idolatry of security, this idolatry of, of power, we once again see it, it, it distorts history, it speculates about the future, and it creates narratives that we begin to believe in. Now, unlike Pharaoh... So Pharaoh was in a place of power, but worshiping the idol of power. Israel's in a place of weakness and and idolizing and worshiping the idol of of power and security. So they they can't resort to violence. They can't resort to the military. Instead, what they do is they lash out against authorities. They lashed out against God and they lashed out against Moses. And then they made that accusation to him. So dying in the wilderness, being, in a, being vulnerable, being, vulnerable being, being unprotected, was their greatest fear. The fear of not being secure, protected, and, and taken care of. And as we will see as the story unfolds, and we, don't, we won't hit this until we get to the book of Numbers, um, they're going to die in the wilderness. This generation dies in the wilderness. Why? Because of their response to their fears. Their idolatry to security and power and their response to that is what will bring them the same destruction that they fear. So what we fear, our our efforts to avoid what we fear actually lead to our demise. What is it that they worshipped? Well, ultimately, we see that what they longed for and what they desired and what they were worshipping was the security and comfort of an enslaving state. Once again, we see, all, we see this also in this situation with Russia and the Ukraine. There are two, two things that I've read the past couple of weeks one out of the American Purpose, which is an online magazine that uh, Francis Fukuyama started. Um, this is by a Russian, his name is Vladimir Tismanunu, called Putin and Fascism. And he says this, the irony is that so long as Putin 
his crony oligarchs and bureaucrats and their protégés remain in power. And as long as the revolutionary impulse of its people remains dormant, we can maintain with utmost certainty that Russia will never achieve any kind of prominence other than as the epitome of a latter-day authoritarianism. So here's what he's saying. As long as the current regime stays in power and as long as its people remain silent, Russia's never going to become anything except an authoritarian state. Then this one is from the New York Times, from Ilya Krasilshik. Russians must accept the truth. We failed. She says this. Again, another Russian. There was a lot of good in the country I grew up in, the one that stopped existing two weeks ago. But responsibility was what we lacked. Russia is a very individualistic society in which people, to quote the cultural historian Andre Zorin, live with a, quote, leave me alone mindset. We like to isolate ourselves from one another, from the state, from the world. And this allowed many of us to build vibrant, hopeful, energetic lives against a grim backdrop of arrests and prison. But in the process, we became insular and lost sight of everyone else's interests. So what we see in it's, it's human nature. It's human nature. Fear, has cha fear chained the people of Russia to inaction. We see that in Israel as well. And again, the worst fears, the fears that led to the actions that led to the demise. So whether we are in a place of power or whether we are in a place of vulnerability, we can become enslaved to the, to the idol of power, to the idol of security. So the powerful in their idolatry utilize violence and oppression to hold on to it. And in the powerless, the idol brings inaction and it breeds insubordination, both of which end up in disaster. So, um, obviously, none of us here are presidents of nations. We're just fathers and mothers and husbands and wives and brothers and sisters and neighbors and friends and workers and employees and co-workers and neighbors and all these. You know, this is who we are. But we're, we're not immune to the temptation to worship, to worship and idolize power and security. I mean, we can see how this plays out in, in domestic and our everyday contexts. Okay, I'm, a, I'm a husband and I'm a father, and that's a, that's a place of authority. Authority is power. Okay, Power in and of itself is not evil. God gives power to people to steward it to the, for the care of others. That's what power is for. But when power becomes something that we hold on to for, its, for the sense of security and greatness and honor that it gives us, then we are, we are using power for our own interests and not the interests of others. So as a husband and father, in my longing for respect... In my longing for honor, those things I want from my wife and my children. And there have been numerous uncountable times where if I have not received those, what do I do? I get angry. I get harsh. I get malicious in my speech. Thinking that the harshness, the anger, and the malicious speech is going to scare them into giving me what I think I need. Mothers can get, necessarily so, are very protective of their children. But in the fearful world that we live in, there are many threats against our vulnerable children. And 
mothers can grow quite fearful of fathers that aren't doing as good of a job as that they think that they need to and therefore become insubordinate and lash out against their husbands for their failures to adequately take care of the family. So we see these very dynamics in our everyday lives. And we, you know, what, I mean, you can just take it over to employers and employees. City governments. The dynamics of power and security are present in every human relationship that we have. And we can see that if we don't change those dynamics within our families, if we don't change those dynamics within our, with, within our workplaces, if we don't change those dynamics within our neighborhoods and cities, we, we know that breakdowns come. In the, in the longing to hold on to the security and honor and respect and dignity and, and, and safety that a family can provide, if a husband and wife and the kids don't get that figured out, the family breaks up leading to weakness and shame and insecurity for everybody involved. Same with businesses, again, cities, governments, etc. So how can we experience a sense of power and security without becoming worshipers of false idols of power and security? And I would argue that we must subject ourselves to the power and to the security of God. That is the only thing that we can do. And so, you know, when we see in, in the book of Colossians, there's this, this great buildup in chapter 1 that is explaining that is explaining that Jesus Christ is preeminent in power over every name, over every authority, visible or invisible, on earth or in heaven. There is no greater source of power. He's the creator. He's the recreator. He's the sustainer, the sustainer of all things in heaven and on earth. Amen. There's this great buildup of, of Christ's preeminence because the rest of the book is going to unfold how understanding Christ's preeminence and entrusting ourselves to Christ's preeminence changes every aspect of our life. If we can get that power dynamic clear, and if we can submit ourselves to the power of Christ and enter into his power, it changes everything. Amen. And we no longer look to other things for that sense of power and security. Jesus himself had to give up power. Philippians chapter 1 explains that Christ, or excuse me, chapter 2, Christ being in nature God did not hold on to that status of God, but he gave it up in order to do two things. One, obey the Father, to submit himself to the power and will of the Father, and to save us which then resulted in his anointing as Jesus Christ the man of being set in the place of authority over every human authority in heaven or on earth, visible or invisible. And so in giving up that power, he, he gained it. He submitted himself to the will of God. He submitted himself to the power of God as a man, as the man Jesus Christ. We will experience the power of God when we submit ourselves to God's power and to God's will. It raised Jesus from the dead, the prayer at the end of chapter 1 of Ephesians. Paul prays that our hearts would be enlightened. Our hearts would be enlightened so that we would know three things. The hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And the third one is that, that we would know the power of God that is at work toward us. The power of God toward us, which also raised Jesus Christ from the dead and set him in a place of greatest authority and power with everything at his feet. So that 
the prayer that, 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 that Paul is praying is that we would understand that power of God that is at work toward us. Why? Because again, and you know, again, the book of Ephesians, I mean, we, the reason why we, we focus so much on Colossians and Ephesians is that they hit almost every area of our lives. They're fairly short, and they are addressing these foundational issues that, that, that set us on a course to, to following Jesus and to, and, and to realizing the power of God. Both books are addressing power. Both, both books, uh, uh, Paul is praying that we would understand the power of God, that the, the prayer in Colossians chapter 1, that we would experience a power from the Holy Spirit to do things that we don't necessarily think we need power for, to endure suffering with joy and patience and gratitude. That's what the power of God is available for us. Why? Because if we can endure suffering with joy and patience and gratitude through the power of God, we won't pursue other things for that sense of power to give us joy and patience, which means the stick to or perseverance, and and thankfulness and gratitude, which is an expression of, of delight. Okay, we will pursue joy and patience and gratitude. If we are experiencing the power of God, it will we'll be directed towards God for those things. If we're not experiencing the power of God, we're going to pursue those in some other way. How can I get through this suffering and be happy? So Philippians, it, it teaches us to stop grasping for power, but to obey and serve and to draw on the power of God. And the book concludes, and I have found great strength from these passages in the last couple of weeks. He says, when you're experiencing fear and anxiety, which is what Pharaoh was feeling, which is what the nation of Israel was feeling, he says, when you're feeling fearful and anxious, which is when we feel like I have no power to control the circumstances in my life, I'm worried about what's going to happen to me. Okay, so he says this, and I'm just going to paraphrase because it kind of takes place over the next 20 verses in chapter 4 there. First thing he says, God is near. God is near. Some translations say God is at hand, but I'll never forget this sermon, Dear to Preach on Philippians 4 one time. She, she, she did some work on the word, and actually it means God is near. Okay, What does it mean that God is near when I'm anxious? He, well, we see it here in Exodus. God wants Israel to know that he alone is Yahweh. There is none like him, and that he is dwelling in the midst of the earth. He is very aware of what is going on. So believe that God is near. He's near. His power is near. Do not be anxious. There's the command. Okay, well, how then not to be anxious? With prayer and supplication, make your requests to God. And then it says this, and the peace of God, which means the the presence of his power in us, will guard, okay? Guard is a protection term. It's a power term. It's a security term. It will guard our hearts and our minds. And I was reading, it was just this week. I I, I turned to this verse again and I cut and pasted it into my prayer list with my other verses because this is so profound. I, I, I had remembered that it says it will guard your minds. I didn't remember that it says it will guard your hearts. And so our hearts are, are, are drawn to the things that we love. Our hearts, it's the seat of our wills and passions and desires. And our hearts have been instructed over all of our lives to love things, all right? And so the process of growing in Christ is the process of retraining our hearts, really. And that's the renewal, right? And so... Um, I know when my heart is loving something, and when I get insecure about not having that, I don't be very specific, it's just, you know, it, it, um, um, if I get worried about money, if I get worried about the church giving, if I get worried about, you know, okay, we're looking at the year out, where are our reserves, we got a plan, we got to strategize, okay, so I, I worry, why? Well, because I love the sense of security that money brings. I do. 
All right, so that's wrong. <laughs> All right, so, and then what happens to my mind is that I perseverate and obsess, and I start thinking, and I start planning, and I start strategizing, and I start worrying, and, and, then, and then I start getting angry and anxious. And so I have to recognize what's going on in my heart and in my mind, okay? And then I, and then I, I just, I, if I don't start my day like this, I'm a mess. It's been this way for over 30 years I have to start my day in prayer and supplication. God, here is what is on my heart. Here is what is on my mind. I am not at peace. I am going to be a wreck if you don't guard my heart and guard my mind. And after some time, my worries subside, my mind clears, and I can start the day with confidence. And then the next day, I need some new mercies. <laughs> So I do it again, and it's a habit. It's a habit. It, I would go mad without it. So this is how we draw upon the power of God. It starts with faith. Do I believe that the power of Jesus is indeed preeminent? If I don't believe that, I'm never going to pursue it. I'm going to keep pursuing the other idols that can provide a sense of joy and peace and happiness. So it starts with faith. Do I believe that Jesus is indeed preeminent? Do I, can, I, can I entrust myself to him? And then can I put my hopes there? Remember in that passage in, in, in Colossians, as long as we don't shift our hope, that Christ will continue this good work. So we've got a faith in Christ, hope in the gospel that will, it will indeed work in our lives. The spirit will indeed work Okay, which then will convert to loving actions, which at sometimes is is this work of making our requests known through prayers and supplications and providing God the opportunity because we don't grasp and reach out for another source of power. We stop and we wait. And we're gonna see this, this need for waiting for the power of God to demonstrate itself as we as we look throughout the rest of, of the Pentateuch. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for the power of God that is available to us. Help us to draw upon it, God. Help us to believe in it. Help us to, to acknowledge where our idols are at. Help us to acknowledge the, the, the idols of security and power that we hold to, and whatever provides those things for us. Help us as a church, God, to, to really experience your power and to, to, to live our lives in a way in this world that would reflect the power of God and not the false powers of this world. In Jesus' name, amen.